Um, I'm really excited to have all of you here today participating in our first online STEM inclusivity forum. Uh, so a little background about Team Tech SF. Uh, we're a nonprofit based in San Francisco Bay Area, and we're dedicated to providing equal access to tech to all teens. Um, and this is through different free events such, such as this one. We also, before COVID, would host events at public schools, at community centers, at libraries, so that anyone could have access to those tech resources. And we're still continuing to do that with our weekly workshop series, uh, which you can also sign up for. And we have our three main events. We have in our in the fall, we had our civic hackathon where students came in to turn their ideas uh, for solving civic issues into tech solutions through our mentorship. We had our global youth, youth summit in uh, the winter where we heard from tech entrepreneurs and now we have our STEM inclusivity forum and we've been able to completely transition online this past year which is really exciting and I mentioned that this is our first online STEM inclusivity forum so I'm really excited that you all are here to witness this and our STEM inclusivity forum is dedicated to um, uplifting those who are usually underrepresented in STEM, those who are usually underserved in STEM, and really empowering them to take on tech opportunities. Uh, so this is through, like Agnes mentioned, we have a wonderful keynote speaker who's going to be talking about her uh, work with social justice and tech. We're going to have a a panel where you're going to hear about different STEM opportunities and also a networking break to be able to actually interact with those different organizations and get to hear more and hear about how you get can get involved. And then we have our workshops afterwards where you'll be able to learn technical skills, um, whether that's STEM skills or even some professional um, skill building workshops, and we'll end it off from there. So we're really looking forward to having you participate in all these really exciting, this really exciting program of different opportunities and hopefully you can get inspired to also go out even under COVID to be able to participate in these STEM um, opportunities. So thank you so much everyone for coming today and I'd like to pass it back to our chairs. Um, we have our three chairs of our STEM inclusivity forum is Agnes. Agnes just spoke before me, Shrabya and Georgie. So thank you, you three for um, organizing this also, I'll pass it back to you guys to introduce Bonnie, our keynote. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming again. Um, thank you, Sarah, for introducing what Team Tech SF is. Um, next up, we have Bonnie Chu, our keynote speaker for today, and she is the founder and CEO of Lensational. Um, we're so we're so excited to have you today um, to just speak on behalf of you know what you do, and um, yeah, we're very excited. Maybe you could give like a brief introduction about what you do, and yeah. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for yeah, inviting me to speak. Um, I'm quite far away from my teenage years now. It's been a kind of, I guess, a decade almost. <laughs> so it's great to be in the room with, uh, with you all and be reminded of how really my teenage years were really transformative of um, the journey that I decided to embark on. So um, yeah, just a bit of background before I give my uh, keynote speech. I um, became a social entrepreneur and my uh, uh, the project I founded is called Lensational, which I'll talk more about, but I'm also the managing director of the social investment consultancy. And I also serve as a senior contributor on Forbes. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, so I will take you through uh, some of the things that I'm hoping to share with you today. Um, so I hope you can see my screen. I have two screens, so you might have to tell me if you see the presentation mode on, or do you see it on full screen? Um, I, think yeah. I think it's not on full screen, I'm not sure. No, we can see your current slide on the next slide. Yeah. Okay, then I will swap this place, yeah. That, this should work now. Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, um, to talk about today, kind of how how do you go about pursuing entrepreneurship at the intersection of social impact and technology? Uh, I'm I, I in if you're interested, I'm on Twitter, which is yeah, Bonnie S Y Chu. Um, so 
perhaps before jumping into my own story, um, we're in 2021 now. Uh, and in 2030, there is uh, quite a big milestone for the world, which is for the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 16 of them, and we're, well, 17 of them, sorry, and we're supposed to be meeting all those goals by 2030. Uh, if your, your eyesight is good, you'll see I actually represent uh, SDG 5, uh, gender equality on this graphic. It is a calendar made by uh, Italian coffee company Lavasa a few years back. And um, just want to let you think about 2030 because you know, you'll probably be my age now in 2030. Um, and you know, for you to really reflect on what's the legacy, what's the change you want to achieve in your next 10 years and whether entrepreneurship, social impact and technology might be some of the things that you choose to embark on. I really started uh, entrepreneurship at 16 years old and I did not think of myself as a social entrepreneur at all. Um, I'm here on the top left uh, and this is my team uh, when we were starting the student company uh, back in Hong Kong. So I'm born and raised in Hong Kong. Uh, I study in an all girls school. Uh, didn't really, I just like studying. I was quite nerdy, but I didn't really uh, think of what to do with my career. Um, but I just so happened to have an opportunity to join uh, what sounded like a really fun program called the Company Program by Junior Achievement. I think Junior Achievement is also uh, a, a NGO in America. Um, so what Junior Achievement sought to do is you have a group of students and then you can decide to participate um, and uh, you could come up with an idea as a team and then you start a company and you create your product, you sell them to the public and then you uh, close the company uh, and you experience all that within a year. And I joined that program and I volunteered myself to be the CEO. I don't really know what was going through my mind at that time. I think I probably was bored with studying and wanted a bit of a challenge. Uh, so I uh, yeah, happened to be the CEO of this company uh, and I had to, we had to brainstorm, like what do we want to do? What products do we want to create? Um, and what's the change we really want to make? Um, and so, yeah, this is my team. We created the product, which is in the middle, um, not a very innovative product. Uh, it, it's called, um, and the company was called I Love. And looking back, uh, some of my friends say we probably would be sued by Apple if we really became a big company. Uh, so it's called I Love and the uh, product is called iCup. So why the I is basically you can customize this plastic uh, mug. So you will see we created some designs. We had a design that's like animal print. We had a design that's an exercise book that we like a kind of vintage style one. And we have one that's Hong Kong, etc. cetera. So um, that's just kind of what we created. And um, some of the things I learned from it was, um, well, first of all, if you had an idea, entrepreneurship is such a great way for you to create change quite immediately. Um, you know, we came up with the idea in a month and then we ordered the mugs from China and then we, we just did the design ourselves. You just could create change really, really quickly. Um, and what I learned as well was uh, social impact. So uh, Junior Achievement, they asked uh, all the companies to think about corporate social responsibility. And so what we did then was um, we actually donated quite a quite a number of our, like around 30% of our profits to make a wish foundation. I mean, it was not a lot of money that we donated around a thousand US dollars, but for teenagers at that time, that felt like a lot of money because we made that money from, from nothing. Um, and in the end, we won an award, which was about corporate social responsibility. We also won an award called Market Potential, but that was my first thing to entrepreneurship. And uh, because it was a student program, then it kind of felt, oh, I could do it. And I really saw myself as an entrepreneur for the first time, which I really didn't see before. Um, and, but that was just a one-off experience. As I said, I had to close the company after a year. Um, but that was a great experience, a really formative one for me to learn about uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, I then uh, started 
uh, Lensational uh, when I was in university at 20 years old. And that was really a real proper social enterprise. Uh, this is a picture of me when I was 19, 20 um, in Pakistan. I was volunteering there. Uh, the idea of Lensational is to train women and girls photography and storytelling and providing platforms to sell and showcase their work. One of the market opportunities I saw was as a Chinese women growing up in Hong Kong, even growing up in Hong Kong where majority Chinese, actually I didn't see myself represented uh, very much in advertising and I just thought there must be a market gap when it comes to um, representation of people of colour. Um, of course I didn't have those terms back in the day but, uh, but basically yeah representation of people of colour in advertising uh, in journalism. And so the idea is to train women, uh, mostly of colour, uh, how to take photographs and then sell their pictures uh, online. And, and this was my pilot. Uh, after a few months after starting the idea, I uh, yeah used disposable cameras because I had to prove the concept. And you know, disposable camera, you can say is not very high tech, but that was a small thing in order to prove the concept. But with this experience, I really saw, I mean, the curiosity in the in the girl I taught, you know, you could see in her eyes and also just some of the beautiful images they were able to take. Uh, but this really started uh, as a Facebook page initially. I started a Facebook page for Lensational on International Women's Day 2013. Uh, I was a few months away from graduating from university, um, we was quite uncertain what was I going to do um, kind of upon graduation, especially coming from a cultural context uh, where entrepreneurship is not the mainstream, um, where parents expect you to get a job, I was quite hesitant whether I could really kind of embark on this, but I started anyway with the Facebook page. Um, and the idea, as I mentioned, is empowering women through photography. And our theory of change talks about kind of emotional empowerment of women, economic empowerment of women as well, and advocacy. So our model is 50% of revenue from the photos we sell goes back directly to uh, the women and girls and the rest goes back to Lensational as a nonprofit uh, to continue our work. But I really wanted to do social enterprise um, compared to other forms of businesses or charities. Um, and, you know, I'm just showing this kind of spectrum just for you to think about. There are many, many ways to create change and social enterprise is just kind of the way I thought was the most uh, relevant or most interesting for me. Uh, you know, there are great things that people can do. I know lots of people who started charities and, you know, they fundraise and do a fantastic job. But for me, uh, was more a um, an intent to really align the business value that's generated by the organization, which is the act of selling images with the social value. So that 50% of revenue going back to our organization and 50% going back to the women. And uh, I think this is also, you know, in the past few years, really since I graduated from university, I just see a lot more happening around this uh, gray area between very traditional charities and purely commercial enterprises. Um, so that, yeah, that's just something for you also to think about kind of in the spectrum, where do you see yourself in your own career to develop down the road? Uh, and where the technology comes in, I guess, is of course the photography. We, after the pilot, we then migrated to digital photography. Um, so we get in, usually cameras uh, donated from individuals and then we use those cameras in our photography workshops. We created a, a standard training and then uh, those digital images get uploaded to different platforms. For example, we have distribution lined up uh, for Getty Images. Um, we also do exhibitions, physical ones, digital ones. Um, and um, yeah, uh, we also have our own uh, platform. I just see some photographs uh, coming, uh, sorry, some questions coming up in the chat. Um, Kind of we we created it as a nonprofit still, um, even though we, I mean we kind of how, how should I explain this? So I 
created Lentasia as a social enterprise, uh, but that's more because we have a business model where we can generate income. And there are lots of definitions of social enterprises, but uh, one can say social enterprise is a, for, is a type of business model where majority of your income is generated through sales or trading activities. Um, and, but still we were set up as a nonprofit, so I don't have shareholders who would personally profit from it. Uh, but yeah, happy to answer more questions um, also later. But uh, Getty Images, for example, we lined up as a distributor around two years into starting Lensational. And for Getty Images, it was really the geographical reach that they were really interested in. Uh, so through Facebook, we expanded to uh, a global network uh, of volunteers in many parts of the world. So these are people who are interested in our mission and who don't mind just going ahead and starting a program in their country. Uh, so Getty Images were really interested in the wide geographical spread of our work, particularly in Africa, because they don't get uh, many images from Africa. Um, and so we set up a deal with Getty Images so that they can, we can sell our photographs through them. Um, the photographs are taken by the women. They are uh, very, many different types of images, just showing you some kind of images. Um, it can just be kind of their daily lives, how they live, uh, but it could also be something a bit more artistic uh, or something more focus on a particular social issue like the top bottom right is uh, from our program in Bangladesh that's very focused on garment workers and um, so the garment workers uh, of course that's talking about the story of our global supply chain uh, and the top uh, top right hand corner is a photograph of uh, a woman who is a, a collector of waste plastics and so those images were actually made into a photo book about women and the environment and climate change so the kind of photos are all very different uh, the kinds of images that make it to the getty platform would have more commercial value whether that is speaking to issues that businesses care about or they might just be images that um, elude like emotions so people buy as stock images. Uh, and stock imagery is around $2 billion kind of dollars, uh, revenue every year. So it's, it's quite a big industry. And it's just things that people use on newspaper articles or on websites, et cetera. So that's really kind of the market that we're, we're tapping into. I'm happy to kind of share more uh, how uh, my journey of creating Lensational, but the links back to technology is uh, a few things. So one, we use digital photography, so that meant we didn't have much physical assets as an organization and that allowed us to scale much quicker than if we would have more physical assets. Uh, one physical assets that we did have was the cameras. So a few years into that, we actually pivot more to using mobile phones, but we still use cameras because in order for some of the students to transition to become professional photographers, and some of them really do that, um, they do need more professional cameras and uh, they wouldn't be able to afford that otherwise. So uh, we therefore use both mobile phones and kind of more sophisticated cameras. And some of our, our donations would actually be DSLRs. Um, and then we just ship them off to whichever program location uh, that we, we are having. But yeah, the technology allowed us to scale very quickly. Um, and it also allow us to scale quickly through reaching so many people in so many different parts of the world, really through our Facebook page. Um, and we were able to do that without very much money uh, to start with. So th those are just, I think, some of the potential really of technology. Uh, but of course, technology also linked to women's empowerment. And it's great to hear that this is a forum for people interested in STEM, but also for people who are traditionally underrepresented. I mean, there is definitely a race dimension within the US that I can't really comment, but uh, from a gender angle, um, I thought of myself as a social entrepreneur um, because of my experience when I was 16 years old, uh, but I didn't really think of myself necessarily as a social entrepreneur using technology. And I only managed to do that 
I think in 2016, when I joined an accelerator program that's focused on mobile technology to create social impact. And that was run by Vodafone Institute. Um, but why gender matters? Uh, I did study computer in high school, uh, but there just wasn't any role models uh, for you to look up to and for you to think this is something for me. So I just dropped it really. Um, and I think I only picked it up after starting Lensational and realizing the potential of technology. And now I kind of, well, I still regret a little bit that I didn't pursue that. Um, I've written a few Forbes articles about this um, topic and kind of the intersexual gender and technology. Uh, one on the left, I put in a, a screenshot. Uh, I interviewed two women, uh, one who, well, probably a few years older than most of you, uh, studying computer science in a university uh, in America, and one who used to study 30 years back uh, computer science uh, in university. And talking to both of those women, how coding has changed, but also not changed for women in the past 30 years. So that might be an interesting read for some of you. Uh, but there are lots of really exciting initiatives that I wish was there when I was a teenager. Uh, I uh, wrote about Technovation Challenge. Maybe some of you have uh, come across it, but it's a challenge uh, to encourage girls from across the world to solve real world challenges through technology. So I feature two teams that won um, this. And um, this is, yeah, maybe another uh, inspiring article for you to read as well. Um, but I, yeah, hope my uh, sharing is interesting. Uh, there are lots of dimensions of, this, of my story that I uh, probably couldn't have gotten into, but I'll just end with uh, a quote that I uh, heard from two people who were really influential in the first few years of my social entrepreneurship uh, journey. Um, so uh, my two mentors share with me that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful and dedicated people can change the world. And indeed is the only thing that the world ever has. Um, so yeah, I hope you would all feel if there are something that you feel very passionate about and want to accomplish and make a change that you can, whatever um, people around you will, uh, around you might say. Um, so with that, I will turn to some questions and I think, yeah, we have maybe around five minutes left. Is that right? Uh, or whoever else yeah that sounds good um if anyone has any questions feel free to just drop it in the chat um just starting off i know that some people messaged me privately um yeah so one of the questions include um what advice do you have for young people especially young girls who want to turn their idea for a tech company into a reality yeah and um, so my advice is really to start small and to take uh some steps some small steps to validate your idea. I mean, I show this image of, um, of the kind of disposable camera because, you know, in the beginning, I had a very grand idea, which is to equip marginalized women and girls across the world with digital photography and storytelling uh, training. But uh, yeah, but, Sorry, I'm distracted by some of the comments coming in. Uh, but in order to, to do that, I it, it's a bit too big. So I really have to start somewhere. And so I started with the, you can say, analog technology, which is just disposable camera, but to test the idea. Um, also, when I, in the beginning, um, before starting the Facebook page, actually, I was going through a few business plan competitions in university um, and I didn't get anywhere at all. And actually, uh, some of the professors asked me not to continue because it's a stupid idea or whatever. Um, and I really, yeah, almost uh, did not start Lensational. Uh, but I think what I learned after that is if I start a Facebook page, if I do something small every day, then I can actually test whether this idea works and bit by bit, I, I build that. So you can have a really grand idea and most people don't actually go and realize the idea because this is too grand and it's very hard to think of, well, how do I go about realizing this big mission? So just start something small and uh, each step will lead you to the next step. I mean, the technology you can say, you know, is quite, uh, 
a old technology, so probably not technology for you guys, because that is digital photography, uh, is the use of social media. I mean, we are toying uh, with uh, the use of artificial intelligence to help analyze the images in a more automated manner and the kind of trends that um, can be drawn from these images and tying that to satellite imagery. So I'm, I'm uh, exploring that in a new startup. Uh, but yeah, maybe the technology sounds a bit uh, too simple for, for this generation. Um, in terms of another question I've got, yeah, why photography? Um, it's, I mean, yes, there are lots of different forms of art uh, that, uh, people can embark on. There are a few, few reasons underpinning photography. Um, one reason is I thought a lot about illiteracy as a barrier to a lot of people across the world not being able to express themselves. It might seem like a very far away issue because uh, I guess most of you do live in the US, but uh, two thirds of the world's uh, population, well, two thirds of the world's illiterate population are women and that's around 500 million people, uh, women who can't read and write. So uh, it is a very big issue. Um, and photography uh, can transcend those barriers. And uh, my grandmother, for example, who raised me was illiterate, uh, uh, but she was really able to express herself through photography. Um, and so, yeah, that was my inspiration in the beginning of, of exploring photography. Um, and uh, later on, I also looked at really the how pervasive technology uh, this photography is in the world we live in. Everything is visual. And when I think a lot about representation of people in media, um, that's very much linked to the images and how gender norms, how social norms continue to be perpetuated very often is also through the images that we see. So the idea then to kind of counteract some of those gender and social norms, therefore to, to use photography to do that. But yeah, it was just kind of an, have an idea. Um, sorry, I don't understand what NFTs are. <laughs> if someone can enlighten me. Apparently they're like non fungible token, like maybe it's like some like cryptocurrency stuff. I don't it's know. basically uh, digital ownership of anything technology, oh, and then uh, you make money off of every sale, like a certain percentage. Um, you get money yeah. by selling it and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a very interesting idea. I mean, I just saw that. Uh, in the news in kind of the last month or so. Uh, so yeah, we'll definitely think about that. So thank you for the tip. Yeah, thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, wonderful presentation and we're very proud of what you're doing and thank you for doing what you do. Um, yeah, next up we will move on to um, the panelists. So we have different panelists here. I hope they are all in the... Um, they're all let in by now, but um, we have four different panelists that will speak on behalf of what they're doing. So that includes um, Feminist AI, YFYI, um, Justin at Salesforce, and Technovation. Um, I'm sure that they will give a little brief description of who they are. Maybe each of you guys can introduce yourselves and we can get started from there. So why don't we start off with Haley from Feminist AI. Um, yeah, uh, just to start off, um, I am kind of a core team member of Feminist AI. We are a nonprofit that is um, based in LA, but right now is pretty global. And our mission is really to create, you know, um, open and intergenerational spaces for BIPOC and LGBTQIA. Um, women, non-binary folks um, to really gather and help build technology together. Um, so our goal is to help to demystify and provide education to help promote um, accessible AI for all. And um, a little bit about me, myself. Um, I am a, I use pronouns she, her, and I'm based in Vancouver, Canada right now, which is on unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Indigenous territory. And um, I've been working with Feminist AI um, for about 10 months now um, on some 
lots of uh, different internal and external operations. And I'm super excited to hear from everybody today about the different types of organizations that are here and to just uh, talk to lots of new folks. Um, yeah, we're really excited to be here at Team Tech as well. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, and then we can just go down. So if Maria um, from, from YFYI could introduce, and then Justin, and then um, Judy from Technovation. Hi, everybody. My name is Maria Isabel. I am the coordinator of YFYI. YFYI is a youth-led philanthropy program. So we give out like grants to other youth who want to create um, either like an organization or um, like let's say like a scholarship, something like that. Anything that revolves around like creating change and advocating for needs in their communities. So that's what the youth get to do. Um, yeah, and I'm a part of the organization called Chalk. And our, our philosophy is that we believe young people can do anything with the appropriate amount of training and support. So youth that are in the program get trained on how to interview and then just kind of like identify the issues that are going on in their communities. And so that we can better direct the money. Thank you. Thank you for introducing yourself. Um, Justin from Salesforce, could you introduce yourself next? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to meet all of you virtually. Uh, I am Justin Friend, um, like your friend, you can't forget it. I am based in San Francisco, California. I am here representing not only myself, but Salesforce, where I've worked for the past five-ish years in a variety of different roles, starting with technical architect all the way through to product uh, marketing. Um, and I'm currently the chief of staff for the customer success and adoption group. So what that is, is basically once sales sells the product, our group actually builds it. Uh, customizes it and delivers it to the customer, and then also ensures that the customer is adopting the product, making sure they're happy with it and achieving better business value. Um, not only that, my other, outside of my day-to-day -day job, I am also the leader of the customer success, uh, racial equality and uh, uh, STIRCO, um, as you call, or you might heard the task force um, that we've actually launched last year, obviously um, in congruent with uh, world events. Um, and I'm going to talk about that um, a little bit later today, but thanks for having me. Super excited to meet you all. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you. And um, Judy from Technovation, could we hear an introduction from you? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Judy Almada. I'm the program director at Technovation. Technovation is a global nonprofit um, where we empower girls and families to use cutting edge technology to solve real world problems in their community. So the technologies that we're focusing on REL as artificial intelligence. So our program will give you the skills that you need not only to, to code a mobile app, um, but learn how to use artificial intelligence if that's of your interest, um, to be able to create a solution um, that you'll be able to um, use within your community. So not only is this a coding program and an introduction to artificial intelligence, but you also develop the entrepreneurship skills to lead and run a business. So if you are interested in learning how to pitch your business, your invention that you've created, come to our breakout room to learn a little bit more about how you could be part of Technovation Girl. Awesome, we have so many amazing panelists here today. Um, all the attendees, um, please look over the event program um, so you know which networking breakout you would like to join. Um, I can put the event program in the chat and yeah, please look over that so you know which um, breakout you would like to join. Yeah, just take a second to look at that and then we will ask um, the panels some questions and then we will transition into um, networking breakout rooms where you'll be able to choose um, which panelists you'll meet with. All right, um, we'll do one question now, I guess. Okay, so the first question for our panelists are, how did you get into STEM or how do you help others that work in STEM? And what was one moment or opportunity that led you to a career in STEM? We can start with, um, it doesn't really matter. We can start with Maria. Hi, 
Um, so Wi-Fi I is not specifically, I'm not in a specific STEM major or yeah, field, but we do fund any pro, any type of um, project or community or organization or um, yeah, just idea that focuses on STEM. We do wanna be inclusive of, um, for example, like Teen Tech SF, you know, they provide access to folks who don't really normally have access to technology um, and who are interested in the STEM field. So we they would apply with us and then that's how they could get money um, to either continue having like workshops or stuff like that. So yeah, that's how, that's kind of how we're connected with the philanthropy, mm -hmm. a lot of the seed funding. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Haley, would you like to speak next? Yeah, sure. Um, so for, I guess to start off with just my own personal experience, um, I um, went to university actually for media studies and was studying a lot of like, um, you know, visual art and like film and that kind of thing. And I had a mandatory computer science class that I had to take and I was dreading it so much. And um, afterwards I actually ended up really enjoying it. And then I ended up um, minoring in the subject and that was kind of my introduction to technology was kind of by accident. Um, so yeah, um, that was kind of my own personal sort of um, point of awakening, I suppose. Um, but I was really interested in what drew me to the work of Feminist AI is um, spending all this time, you know, in school and talking with my friends about how much technology is impacting all of our everyday lives. But so many of us don't necessarily understand the types of technologies that are actually at play that are helping um, determine and shape all of the decisions that we're making in the world um, and are happening to us. So. That was kind of why I wanted to get interested in feminist AI, especially because they are taking kind of this intersectional feminist lens in order to um, try and understand the implications of things like artificial intelligence technologies that shape so many of our everyday lives, but are keeping in mind all of these different, uh, you know, really important social factors that are often overlooked. So yeah, that was kind of my, um, my starting point. Sounds really interesting. Thank you. Um, Justin, would you like to share next? Yeah, um, nothing too much to add based on what you heard so far. But I mean, my personal story, let's just be real. I actually did not go to school for anything STEM related. I wanted to be a uh, media lawyer um, and I wanted to be a publicist in LA. What? That's crazy. So I went to school for journalism. Um, <clears throat> what led me at Salesforce? And you're all like, what? How are you doing this? How are you a technical architect? And how are you getting into that? field. First off, um, it's just by chance, it's about networking. The CFO of my last company um, actually knew somebody who was working at Salesforce. It was a little bit something that I wanted to do, which was enablement, was what I, my enablement, which is basically like um, uh, teaching folks on how to do their jobs. Um, and I love doing that. Um, and I got my foot in the door that way. But after I did that, I realized that enterprise software and the cloud, what is this cloud? It's so invisible. Like what is all of that was so fascinating um, that I actually learned how to, um, all, all the ends and ends of customizing a CRM platform all the way through from start to finish. And I got my um, Salesforce certified admin and then I just didn't stop there. I wanted to continue to build. So technology has always been through to through with me and how we give back to um, those who want to come and work at Salesforce and vice versa. We actually, and I'll talk about that in my, my session is we actually do a give back model to a lot of schools and provide technology and licenses um, before people can graduate um, just to see if they would like to continue to work in such product. Um, so that's kind of my story. Um, it's kind of fun. Thank you for sharing. Really interesting story. Um, Judy, do you have anything to add on? Yeah, um, for me, uh, I, I didn't, as a young person, I wasn't exposed much to STEM opportunities. So that didn't come for me until a little bit later. I am 39 years old. So a lot of you are much younger younger than me and you're already getting um, into uh, technology and, and, and science and all these engineering um, uh, fields and acquiring the knowledge and the skills because that's the ne next best thing. Um, I think for me the big turning point was coming to Technovation and really learning um, how to develop that um, engineering mindset um, and really going through iterations and practicing and failing and doing again. Um, 
And before that, I was working in after school in education, like in actual brick and mortar schools and running after school programs there. Um, but being at Technovation has really helped to reframe my mind of like what is possible who can do science, who can do technology, um, how girls can go in, how women could go in. And also there's a big place for women to take up there. So um, just learning a lot about our, how we can develop our skills, even though we don't have that background at any point in our life um, has, really, has really been um, life-changing for me. So I'm really excited to see all of you young people um, already here and learning um, and acquiring the skills because um, that's what we're gonna need to continue fixing the issues Issues, the global issues that we're already seeing and encountering. Thank you, I definitely agree. And thank you for all the panelists for such thoughtful responses. Um, I think now we'll go into networking breakouts. Agnes, do you wanna take over? Yeah, um, thank you for like a brief you know, introduction of like where you guys come from and what you guys do. Um, yeah, next up we'll like transition into networking breakouts. So um, yeah, like, first off, I want to introduce Steven because he's also going to have a networking breakout. Um, he's currently a NASA intern. Um, if you want to do like a little brief introduction about who you are, and then we can transition into networking breakouts. Yeah, sure. Nice to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Steven No. Um, right now, I'm currently a NASA intern with Stena Space Center. And previously, I had a NASA internship at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, I majored in mechanical engineering. I've also had a, uh, always had a passion in STEM going through school and being able to work for NASA, even only as an intern, I get to work on really cool things and really make a difference for space exploration and just humankind in general. So really excited to meet everybody and be able to speak on NASA's behalf of different opportunities that we have available for you guys. Can anyone else hear Agnes? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, we're gonna transition into the breakout room. So you guys feel free to choose which breakout room you guys wanna um, participate in. And um, each person that will facilitate the breakout room will go more in depth about what they do and um, where they come from. So if Brian could open it up. Yeah, I'll open up the breakout rooms. Um... And also you won't see a Wi-Fi breakout room because they'll stay in the main session. Um, and then um, if you uh, have trouble going into a breakout room because sometimes people have an older version of Zoom, they can't actually choose for themselves, um, just uh, private message me in the chat and I can get it sorted for you. So I think we're um, doing the networking breakout sessions for about 15 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, so we'll have um, our first one, we'll have two sessions, quick ones, so you guys can get to drop into two that you're interested in. So we'll have one from about like 10.50 now to around like 11 like two or three-ish, and then we'll transition to the next one from 11 like three till 11.20. Uh, so yes, please feel free to choose the breakout room that you want to hear more from for the organization. Um, so yeah, do that right now. And panelists, please move into your breakout rooms. Cool. So all the panels are in their breakout rooms. If once again, if you um, need trouble going into a different breakout room, um, go ahead and private message me. Uh, I guess, um, Isabel, you can start. Thank you so much. Um, quick question. I'm able to share, right? I am. Okay, nice. 
Thank you, everybody. So this is for Y for I. Y for I is youth funding youth ideas, and it's like a philanthropy program. So give me one second. Okay. And so sorry about all the tabs. But okay. So okay, we're gonna start. So Y for I is a San Francisco based organization. It is it stands for Youth Funding Youth Ideas. And you know, get money, make change. That is our Okay, so I'm gonna go over the history of Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi started in 2003, and basically we received money from the DCYF, which is like from the city, and they give us three percent of the property taxes, and so it's like around two hundred thousand dollars. And then with that money, we've been able to fund over 300 youth-led projects and 2.5 million in total. Over 70 youth have worked to develop Wi-Fi and shape the culture of the program. And we're very happy that it's coming this far. And those were some of the youth, the previous youth. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. My bad. I'm like, which side? Okay. So here are some facts. So we engage opportunity youth from different backgrounds, ages 14 to 24, from undeserved or marginalized areas of San Francisco. So yeah, we work with folks up to 14 to 24, and they're the ones who get employed with YFI, and they we want to make sure that they come from these, these backgrounds um, as well, because it's it's a way that we're able to see what's actually going on, like what issues are um, you other youth interested in, you know, what things do they wanna do they wanna change in their communities or fix or create more opportunities for. And we allow young people to use their life experiences to create change. So yeah, so we wanna make sure that we're um, able to not only um, our, our philosophy is different, really different with from other employment in the sense that we, we support other youth with like, let's say if they're going through, let's say if they're undocumented or in their foster, they're in foster care, um, we actually want to use those life experiences to help um, either create solutions for themselves or also for their community. And here's some more facts. So we call ourselves a youth-led social justice philanthropy program. Um, have you guys ever heard of philanthropy? See, you could do a nod, a no, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so a lot of times um, philanthropy, um, you hear about it, like let's say if there's like a big fundraiser or there's like an auction or stuff like that. Um, and that's the, the traditional philanthropy but the youth-led philanthropy and social justice one that we focus in is geared more towards um, youth that have an actual say in like where the money goes. And as like we talked about in a little in the previous slide, that they bring their own experiences, right? So all those things that they deal with, um, yeah, those issues can be like addressed and like brought up. And that's what the social justice part is. And there are two other programs like us in San Francisco, YEF and Bling. YEF is run by the YMCA and Bling is another organization that they both fund other youth-led projects as well. And then we give out $10,000 max for a project. Each year, we give out a total of $100,000. We have two cycles, October and April, but this year, yeah, we only had one cycle because of COVID. Um, and we are community funders, so and we also host an annual PYM conference, which is like a youth-led conference that um, the, all the youth like work on and similar to this. Yeah, last year we did a like youth caravan. And so we like drove around the city and distributed like food boxes 
um, shared PPE items are the stuff. And how to apply. So I'm gonna go over how you can apply to um, YFYI's grants. So we have two cycles, one in Mar March and second one in September. It ends in April 1st, and then the September one would end in October 1st. That's like the time period you would have to apply. You can apply on our website, yfi.org, or join our newsletter. We send out um, reminders of like, oh, there's an application coming out, stuff like that. And you can email us at um, yfiinfo at chalk.org. Or you can also leave it in the chat box, your email, and I can put you on the list. But yeah. So I'm going to just show you the application. So this is our website. And the application is right here. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys a couple tips of like things that we look for, or things that um that would could potentially make it so that folks don't go to the second round. What do you guys think is like one of the main the main things that gets people um either not able to go on to the second round to like where you get to interview and stuff like that. Okay. You could put it in the chat box or okay. So the main the main thing that would get somebody not um qualified to not qualify for one of our grants is if they turn in an uncompleted application. Okay, so we want to make sure that folks um read through everything. Um, and the first part, you just put your primary, youth, the youth leaders, the, their information. You would want to go to the name, date, zip code, ethnicity, all that good stuff. And of course, contact information. And then after that, you want to also put an adult support, like an adult ally. So this person, um, an adult ally is somebody who just kind of supports you in either sometimes deciding on things let's say like budgeting you know that might be something that you you might need support with especially i feel like a lot of times um when i was younger i did not have the best financial literacy you know um so that would be an area that my adult ally would have supported in um yeah and uh, anything else that you would need support in like let's say they can give you connections to either somebody you can network with stuff like that okay? but overall you would um if you were to apply you would be the main leaders of this project and then after that you wouldn't want a fiscal sponsor a fiscal sponsor is basically somebody who um who sponsors you yeah normally we look for 501c3s which are like nonprofits. um you could folks have like put schools um not local nonprofits what else yeah stuff like that churches stuff. you put that then demographics and we want to make sure that the youth who apply to this grant um are in san francisco or have ties to to san francisco um but a lot of times in any application that you fill out for the future like let's say if it is like a different grant um from a different organization or national grants they'll ask for like similar things to this so white ages will be participating in the project you want to put the age range so we support 14 uh, ages 14 oh yeah chalk supports 14 and 24 and from here you can work with folks that are 10 to 24 from in the chalk applications and then what is the gender of the participant it's some demographic questions ethnic breakdown of your community and then yeah these are just like data things for our funders to know and for us to also see how um how connected the the project is to serving the communities so yes, we go through the 
communities they might identify as, what is your average income, neighborhoods that you would be targeted, targeting. And after that, we get to project details. So project details are basically where we have all our categories. Um, so folks, since you guys, you know, do tech and stuff like that, you might want to be looking at tech diversity. Um, if folks want to do like policy advocacy, like let's say a campaign, that would be that. We also offer for like health and wellness. Like we've had projects that focus on like either making gardens, stuff like that. That, would, that could either go in health and wellness if it's like medicinal or, or it could also be culture and activity. So the other ones are economic empowerment, um, policy, advocacy and research, health and wellness, EDLID, education deliberation, earth care, youth rights, activism and culture, media and technology. And then you just put a brief description of why you would think the project, your project fits in that category. And then this is where you would put the project summary. And, you, and then this part, you just wanna address the questions of like, what is the issue you're trying to solve? What is your project? All those good stuff. And then you put your timeline and it would be like six months, nine months, 12 months, the budget. And that would be it. And you could just like email it to us or, or drop it off. But yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, email to at yfyfo.shop.org. But mm. yeah, that is basically it. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, because we are, um, we have about a minute before everyone's going to come back from the breakout rooms. If you have a question, quickly type in the chat. But um, maybe for the participants in here, like. Uh, could you tell us um, more about some other projects that you've funded in the past besides Team Tech SF, of course? Yeah, so another project that we funded is, let's say, um, um, youth from Mission High School. They created, like, scholarships for, like, undocumented youth. That's one of them. They um, There's also, like, a mural. Where there was um, somebody that had passed away that was, like, a community member. So they did a mural. There's been, um, I think there's also been like an organization that focused on giving back, making like feminine product bags to unhoused folks. Yeah, so we have a lot of like different um, projects that we've been able to fund. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah, um, I hope you got all enjoyed the breakout rooms. Um, we're gonna wait probably like a minute or so until everyone just comes back, or is everyone back? No, okay, no. Yeah, we'll wait a little bit and then we will um, go to the second round of network breakout rooms. Um, and yeah, so let's wait like a minute or so. I think everyone's back now. So. Okay, sweet. Yeah, so we're also going to do a second round of networking breakout rooms. Um, so feel free to choose another breakout room that you might be interested in. And we'll also um, be in there for about like 15 minutes or so, just so you can um, get to know each individual and what they do. Sorry, let me just um, rename the breakout rooms real quick. Yeah, in the meantime, if you want, feel free to drop something in the chat, like some like a good piece of advice that you got or anything. Um, we'd love to see you share that with other participants, but have the rooms be re been reopened now yeah yes okay.
Yep, so same thing, please join from clicking the bottom right. And if you can't like choose which one you wanna be in, just direct message Brian. See y'all. Everybody, my name is Maria Isabel, and I'll talk about Wi-Fi. I feel like a couple of us are like okay. It's a beautiful Saturday, so that's great. So Wi-Fi. Okay, so Wi-Fi stands for Youth Funding Youth Ideas. <clears throat> Our goal is, you know, to get money, make change. And here's a little history. So Wi-Fi started in 2003, and we basically receive our money from taxpayer dollars um, from the Children's Fund. So we receive 3% of the property taxes, and they go to ser serving children and youth and their families. And we've had we funded over 300 youth led projects and 2.5 million in total. Over 70 youth have worked to develop Wi Fi I, so for culture program. Okay, so we work with opportunity youth from different backgrounds, ages 14 to 24, from undeserved, undeserved or marginalized areas of San Francisco. So we work with we employ folks who are either like in foster care or are undocumented um, or have dealt with any challenges in their life. And we provide like pro, um, professional development, training and employment. And then we allow young people to use their life experiences to create change. So youth who work with us um, also get like case management and career coaching. And we want to best support their needs and I'm gonna get into like how we use their experiences to like change um, their communities. So we call ourselves a youth-led and social justice philanthropy program. So philanthropy uh, basically means like giving out grants and giving out money. And the youth-led part in social justice, normally you see like philanthropy where like people are doing like auctions or like big fancy um, parties, you know, to donate money. Um, but for this, you get to actually um, like bring their experiences and be able to use that to kind of decide like where the money should go. Um, that's how we connect the social justice and the youth-led part. And let's say if you know that um, folks don't have access to housing and there's a project applying for like um, maybe like a campaign to, pro to get more access to low income housing, then that would be something that the youth might be interested in funding. So there's two other programs like us in San Francisco, YEF and Bling. And we give out 10,000 max for a project each year. We give out a total of 100,000. We have two cycles, one in October and April. But this year, um, we only had one because of COVID. And we are community funders. And we also host an annual um, QM conference, which is Power Youth Movement Conference, that is also youth-led. And last time, we had a youth care event. So I'm going to just go over it. Yeah. Okay, so how to apply. So we do have two cycles and you can apply on our website or you can get added to our newsletter and get like notifications as to, let's say like when the application is out and this is our website. 
I'm just going here. And the main thing that people do would not qualify um, to get going into the second round would be, let's say, if they have an incomplete application. Um, so I'm going to just quickly go over it. So you want to put the contact information. And a lot of other applications, like in the future, like if you apply to grants or stuff like that, scholarships, transfer, or similar things. Um, but yeah. So an adult ally, an adult ally is somebody who supports you who is 18 and over, and they just kind of, um, kind of like a bit of a mentor, kind of help you navigate some of the some of the difficult um systems that you might deal with, like let's say like budgeting stuff like that. But overall, the youth are the ones who are in charge of um, the project and who get to follow through with any any big decisions. Okay? And then what you would also need is a fiscal sponsor. A fiscal sponsor is somebody who just like an organization or a nonprofit that sponsors you. And this could be like, let's say a school, a high school. Um, it can also be like a nonprofit, a church, things like that and the demographic information so we just want to know like what communities you're targeting also what communities you represent so we ask for like the age range gender ethnic background breakdown and then here are some other questions like let's say what um what communities do you pertain to like let's say lgbtq with disabilities and stuff like that um and we want to know like the average income and what neighborhoods are you targeting. So YFYI focuses in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, so we would want to focus on giving back the money to those communities. And then these are some of these are categories. So your project has to qualify under one of these. So it would be like economic empowerment, policy advocacy, research, health and wellness education for liberation, health care, youth rights, activism and culture, and media and technology. So we funded other folks who, let's say, like, want to create a garden, a community garden. We funded folks of that nature, also who have had, like, workshops on self-care, um, folks who do want to, um, who do work in policy, like, let's say, um, we had a group of youth who wanted to focus on, like, voter registration um, so they did that we've had scholarships from back youth let's see and a lot of like homeless advocacy like providing like ppe or feminine products to the unhoused women in san francisco and yeah so those are some of the examples of things that we funded and then you want to put a brief description of like why you fit into that category and these are some of the questions for the summary. So like, what is the issue you're addressing? And what are solutions, what solution are you creating? Uh, what is your project important? Um, providing data, support your proposal, telling grids, you know? So, yeah. And then we also would wanna know like how engaged you are with the community. So how much of how, yeah, how, how is that interaction going? Um, how sustainable your project is and how youth led it is. Those are like the three things that we like to make sure that it has. And then you, we would ask for a timeline. So six, my, six months, nine months, or 12 and a budget sheet. So we just wanna know like how you would spend the money. And at the end of this, um, let's say if you do get of one of the grants, then we would just like check in with you once a month to see how everything is going and if you need any support. And we have supported folks in like getting like a fiscal sponsor if you need one, and stuff like that. And you can like email us, email us application back or drop it off at our office. Which is right there. Are there any questions? Questions? There's not. Yeah, if you do, feel free to put them in the chat or just save them. Yeah, I guess I can ask a question. It'll be different than last time. 
Um, so, yeah. Um, what do you think is the most rewarding part of your work at YFYI? Yeah, so the most rewarding part would be just um, building community, a lot of community. I feel like since we do offer like employment, a lot of other jobs, um, you know, you normally don't get the amount of support that we offer. Like let's say like the career coaching and the case management. Um, yeah, that has really been rewarding. And I, I started there as like a youth and now like I run one of the programs and I also work at like um, the Mission Hub, the Latino Task Force Hub. Like I've gotten so many connections and I've gotten support with so many things. Like, yeah, like um, that has been the rewarding part. Like being able to give that support back for sure. And yeah, just some, some people, to a lot of people actually, Shock has given them like a sense of family. And so, yeah, so Wi-Fi like helps with that, like building community, um, yeah, building community and a lot of professional development. Like, how do you, how are you supposed to act in a, in a professional setting? Um, what are ways you can manage like difficult conflicts? You know, um, all that training is very important and can use, can be used like anywhere else. So that for sure. Thank you for the question. You guys have any plans for the weekend? I mean, feel free to type in your chat the plans for the your plans for the weekend. I'm mostly gonna get some rest, um, get caught up because it's my spring break and I'm going back to school next week. Yeah, I feel that my nephew and my niece are coming, so I'm gonna see them soon. Have some little family time. Very cool. It looks like um, if there are any more questions in the chat, it's about time to close the breakout room. So I'm going to bring everyone back. I guess while we're waiting for people to get back, um, maybe do you want to tell us about like what was one of your favorite projects that you funded besides Team Tech SF? Yeah, I actually do really, I really do admire you guys. Like that is an amazing project. Um, another one would be there's this project the called peace club and it is for like newcomers um at the mission high school and so it's like um they it's just a whole, like a club like a club of newcomers and i know that a lot of times if you do come from a different country you don't really have any either no family or not that much support so i i feel there's a very good like strong need for that so yeah that's yeah, it's good thank you yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much to Isabel and thank you so much to the rest of the panelists who uh, held their own breakout rooms. Um, I'd like to turn it over to another Chin SF leadership member so we can go into the skill building workshops. Wait, really quick. Hi. Yeah, I just want to yeah. jump in and just give a huge Sorry. thank you again to like our panelists. Yeah, before we transition into the workshops. But yeah, just huge thanks for all the panelists for coming on a Saturday morning and to speaking to our participants. I know they're all extremely excited to like have the opportunity to network to hear from you and your company or your organization and to get involved. So we really, really appreciate it here at Team TSF. And um, uh, feel free to like drop any like emails or like contact information or programs that participants can sign up to in the chat and uh, we'll make sure to also email all our participants with those resources as well. So just a huge thank you to, to you all again.
And now I'll pass it over to um, the chairs to um, transition to our workshops now. Yeah, so we're gonna start our workshops and um, the workshops we have are, in Phoenix have our PPE workshop. Um, and then we have our game of life workshop led by feminist AI team member Haley. And then intro to game design with Pygame, game, intro to web development and app development with Technovation student ambassador Trishala Jane. Give me a second to recreate the breakout rooms and open them. Um, so yeah, the PPE workshop is basically Teen Tech SF starting in January of this year. Uh, we've uh, sewn hundreds of face masks and 3D printed hundreds of face shields through our PPE initiative. Um, and our special focus this year on a leveraging tech for civic engagement and really giving back to the community and supporting them um, during uh, times of COVID. Um, and so um, that workshop will be in the main room. The other ones you can choose a breakout room to attend. Um, um, but yeah, if you're interested in getting involved or learning more about how we've been able to create PPE these past few months, um, stay in the main room and, and work on getting the breakout room set up. Do the rest of the workshop leaders also want to like introduce their workshops really briefly? I think that'd be helpful. Sure. Yeah, we can. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I'm leading the tech or the technovation app development workshop. Um, so we'll explore some um, like creating an app through Thunk Thunkable, which is like a drag and drop coding. Um, and then we'll also do some UI design. Um, so I'm leading an introduction to Pygame workshop. So we'll be learning about variables, conditionals, loops, and then we'll also get to do some basic animation. Um, I'm one of the leaders in the PPE workshop and we're learning how to ma mass make, make mass and um, as someone can introduce the 3D printing one. Yeah, sure. Um... So I'll be conducting the PPE uh, 3D printing workshop. So if you're interested in learning how to uh, 3D print and um, if you're interested in helping out with our PPE initiative, then you can stay here in the main room for it. Cool. Just to keep things moving, we also have the Game of Life workshop with Feminist AI, which is really interesting, and introduction to website development. Um, I don't think they introduced themselves. Um, I'm going to op open the rooms now and it's going to go for about an hour. Yeah, everyone, please join the workshop that you're interested in. And we'll see everyone back here in the main room in about an hour. So to begin our PPE workshop, um, Emily will start with her presentation on mask making. Oh, okay. I guess I'm going first. Um, let me let me share my screen. Can everyone see it? Okay. Um. So all the pictures and tutorials are from Mass for All CA, and you can find out about them more there in their website. <laughs> so first we would like to gather our materials. We would need a 9 inch by 6 inch 100% uh, cotton fabric pieces, and you, you would need two of them for the front and the back. And then the six and a half inch of elastic, and you will need two for either side, scissors, sewing machine, and thread. 
um, getting started. So make sure that the pattern that you want is faced um, inward because we would flip it after um, sewing the sides. And the fabric should be lined up with the edge of um, the presser foot. And then you would want to stop about two centimeters before and insert one side of the elastic. And, and then on the other side, you would need to stop two centimeters again so that you can put um, the other end of the elastic band and you would rotate it. And then after doing both elastic, you would want to leave a space in between the last side so that you can flip the mess inside out. And then straighten the mess and pleat twice you can also see their video to see like a live action of how they pleat it. And then these are the finished products. Yeah, and these are Team Take SF made next. So these are actually photos from our organization. Yeah, and we distribute them to um, a San Francisco organization. Yeah, so. Um... I believe it was two weeks ago now, um, we gave the uh, SF Human Rights Commission 875 masks um, in order to distribute them to organizations uh, within San Francisco, including the Latino Task Force. Um, and so um, uh, Emily mentioned how we were able to create like the general size masks that we make, but we've also uh, been able to make smaller size masks with smaller dimensions um, because there's a need for child size masks in our community. Yeah, and if you guys have any questions, just feel free to um, unmute or put in the chat. So if anyone is interested in helping um, Teen Tech SF with our PPE initiative. Um, please add your contact info to this spreadsheet so we can get in touch with you and we can help you start sewing masks or um, as you'll learn more about later um, 3D printing headbands. Thank you. Yeah, and also you don't, um, like if you don't have a sewing machine, that's okay because we've also um, loaned out sewing machines to some of our leadership team members. And we've also had other leadership team members um, who have cut out fabric in order to help expedite the process of sewing masks. And so there are a lot of opportunities for you to get involved in that. Um, but yeah, I'll turn it back to the people leading this workshop. Okay, um, I guess we can start the next part of this workshop. Um, it's gonna be about 3D printing. Um, I'm gonna share my slides and then we can start. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. This is the PPE 3D printing workshop. And uh, me, Moda, Georgie are gonna be leading this workshop. So now I'll hand it off to Moda to talk about the basics of 3D printing. Yep. So what is 3D printing? So 3D printing is essentially a way to, uh, 3D printing is essentially a way to uh, reconstruct a, a three dimensional model of a CAD object. 3D printing has a wide variety of applications and typically uses plastic as its main source of material, but metal may be used in more expensive or industrial sized applications. Most 3D printers slowly construct the model by ejecting filament out of the nozzle to create individual layers and continuously print over, over these layers to create the final object. 3D printing is, is normally useful because it has a wide variety of applications. Next slide, please. 
So there are many applications of 3D printers and possible examples include face shields, robotic parts, medical equipment, and vehicle parts. There are also uses in aerospace, prototyping various parts for manufacturing, building houses, construction, art, and jewelry. Um, next slide. So now I'll go over the basic process of how you would, how you would 3D print a certain face shield or face mask. Um, next slide. So the first step is CAD, which is short for Computer Aided Design. Uh, next slide, please. So CAD, also known as Computer Aided Design, is a digital tool that allows you to three-dimensionally three model an object. This is essentially the beginning point for a 3D printed model, as this is where you design how the model looks and define its geometrical properties. CAD software is used by designers to accomplish this task. There are many CAD softwares available online, but I personally use uh, Onshape as it is cloud-based and it is, a, it is a software that my robotics team use, uses. Rhino and Autodesk are also other popular choices, but they are, are locally stored on your computer and are not cloud-based. So to actually 3D print, you would need to create the object that you want to print using CAD software and then save it as an STL file. Um, next slide. So this is just an example of how Onshape looks like when you're utilizing it. And you can see that there's a three-dimensional object being created, created in this picture. Um, next slide. So uh, step two in the 3D printing process is slicing. Um, next slide. So slicing is essentially when you convert a three a, a three dimensional object into a file that the that the uh, 3D printer can read, such as changing an STL file into a G code file. This is one of the most important steps in 3D printing because most printers cannot read or print an STL file. Slicing essentially converts this object into something that the printer can understand and print. When you slice a three-dimensional object, you also specify some of the key properties of the print, such as quality, time required for the print, location of the print relative to the printer, and inflow density. There are many slicing softwares available online. I personally use Cura, but I've also heard that Prusa and, and Simplify 3D are also popular sli slicing softwares. Once you, once you save the file as a G-code file, you can then transfer this file to the printer by either connecting the computer to the printer or by using a micro SD or a TF card. Um, next slide. So this here just shows a picture of Cura, of how the Cura software looks like and how you would splice an object. Um, yes, next slide. Okay, um, so for step number three, setting up the 3D printer. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> so some things um, you need to do before actually 3D printing um, is leveling the bed. And that's um, making sure that the bed is one, the printer bed is one millimeter um, away from the tip of the extruder. So the extruder prints out um, the correct um, like amount of PLA while it's moving around the printer bed. Um, so you get an even um, distribution of PLA. And um, the next thing would be inserting the filament, um, which would be inserting the proper filament such as PLA um, and ABS, which are both types of plastic. And you would do that um, by putting it through the tube that leads to the extruder. And then you would check the tightness of the wheels. And so if the wheels are too tight, they'll become worn down with time. And if they're too loose, the setup will become wobbly. And by adjusting the wheels, you can um, change how the bed, how close the bed is to the extruder. Um, and yeah, <laughs> next slide, please. So step four, the printing process. So you would press print on your printer and then, oh, first you would preheat 
um, the printer, which would be like heating up the extruder to 200 degrees Celsius and the printer bed to 60 degrees Celsius. And this would take about like five minutes um, to fully heat up. And then you would press, um, you would select the file on your printer that you wanted to print. And then you would click print and that would take, um, for our headband, it takes about three hours to print a headband, but other objects, other um, models or figures would take, um, they could take more time or less time, um, depending on how much PLA needs to be laid on to the bed. And once the print is done, um, you need to quickly remove the printed object from the bed because um, it's easier to remove to remove the object from the bed when the bed is hot because otherwise um, is once the print is finished printing, um, the bed will start cooling down and then it might be it'll be more difficult to remove the print. Next slide, please. So this is the Ender 3 Pro, which is what our workshop, I mean, which is what our PPE leaders, student leaders have been using to print um, several hundreds of masks, I mean, headbands. And we've gotten support from some local organizations that have lent us their 3D printers. And we really um, appreciate and rely on that community support. Next slide, please. So now, um, since we still have like 40, I think we have 40, 45 minutes, um, we'll do a CAD demo. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, if you, so first, I think we have a lot of time, so maybe everyone could make an OnShape account if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, so you can follow along with the demo I'm about to do. So we're going to CAD a pyramid. So first, um, once you click on the link, um, you'll have to set up a student account. So fill out the information with your first and last name and your email, and then you would select, sorry, may, may I share my screen, please? Okay, thank you. So first, um, you would fill out this information once you click the link in the chat, and then that will create an educational account. And then you can um, confirm your email and change the default units to inches. And then, um, I'm not sure if anyone is interested in creating an account, so I'll just move on to the demo. But if you need help, um, please private message Moda. Okay, so first, um, I'm gonna create a sketch on the top plane. And then I'll, so first I'll create a square, centered square. Okay, and so now that I've created a square that's centered on the center point of our plane, I'm going to dimension it. So maybe it'll be four inches, four by four. And these sides will be equal. Okay, so now I'm going to label that square. And now I'll extrude it. And that'll also be four inches because we want a cube. And remove that. Okay. So now we have our cube. And now I'm going to create a sketch on this plane. And this will be 
a triangle. So from here to the center, And then I'll remove these sides of the <coughs> sorry of the cube. So then, um, so I'll select through all. So then it gets more prismy. <laughs> and then for one second, I've never created a cube before. I mean, uh. <laughs> prism before. So now I'll make a sketch on this side. Well, first I'll add a plane because if I make a sketch here, it'll be at an awkward angle. So I'll select the right plane and then I'll have this other plane about three inches away. Yes. And then so then I'll create a sketch on plane one. And this will be, this will also be like a triangle. Um, so we can get that pyramid shape. And the thing about Onshape that really makes it easy to collaborate over online virtually is that it's all cloud-based and other people can work in the same studio. So if I shared this document with, for example, um, well, I could share, I could make it public and then link sharing, turn it on and I could share it in the chat. So anyone could edit this um, this document, and that way um, it's easy to collaborate. And our PPE initiative team, we didn't CAD our own headbands. We um, used the file that Curiosity Robotics um, generously shared with us, and um, through that partnership, we were able to get quickly get started on printing headbands. Um, so now I'm going to, so that sketch is good. And now I'm going to straight it. What the heck? Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now we have a pyramid. Yay. And then um, if I wanted to, I could make this into an STL file and then put it through um, Cura, which would splice it and make it. Um, a, and then through Cura, the printer would be able to read this information and print out a cube that would be four by four inches and then four inches high. And yeah, I think we still have like 40 minutes left. I thought our presentation would be longer than this. So. Yeah. Uh, we actually have about 30 minutes remaining, but I guess, um... In the meantime, uh, if people don't have questions, maybe um, Georgie, I don't know if you would want to take this pyramid project further, um, or we can. Um... Wait, you want me to print out the pyramid? No, well, like, is there anything that you could add to this pyramid to make it 
more than just a pyramid? Um, sure. I could, I've never added text to an object, but I could, I don't know. <laughs> or we could do like a quick on-shape workshop. Okay, I'm just going to add something to the pyramid because, okay. Wait, um, Josie, could you share that file with me? I don't think the link works. Wait. Or you can just email it to me. What's your email? Uh, <laughs> modax07 at gmail.com. SK. Moda. SK. SK. Zero, zero 07 at gmail.com. Okay. Cool. Okay. okay. So I'm just going to create, wait, wait, what? I'm going to create. So I'm just going to create a random little slot through the pyramid, make it more interesting. So I made, I constructed these lines through another sketch. And it's good to um, label your sketches and extrusions and all that stuff. Because right now, like if I look at it, I don't really know what's sketch one or what's plane one and all that stuff. So now I'm going to mirror this sketch. And there are a lot of um, features on Onshape. There's the sketching features. You can use um, a line from a different sketch. And then like if I used this line, I would be able to see it in my new sketch. And um, I haven't used like all of the features on Onshape. And, also, there are assemblies, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so right now, I'm just going to make a slot on my pyramid. So I'm going to select a mirror line. And then I'm going to window over these features that need to be mirrored. Uh, one second. OK, so now. I have my little square thing, and now I'm going to extrude through the pyramid. So you get a blind extrusion, and then I'll make that 10 inches. Let's see. OK, so OK, that's way too much. How about 2 inches? So then it goes through the pyramid a bit, as you can see. I don't really know what else I should do with this pyramid. Moda, uh, are you planning on doing something now that you're sure, on the yeah, dock? I could just add okay. something. Um, so I. Could you share your screen, please? Yeah, can you see everything properly? Yeah. So I'll just draw some text on it because. Uh, there you go, easier to see. Text. I'll just take a take a second. So I can draw a text. Uh, yeah, that's too big. Let me edit this. Sorry, wait. Okay, I think that's good. Let me quickly define this relative to a sketch plane.
Moda, maybe you could talk us through what you're doing right now. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm just trying to uh, define this. Um, what does it uh, mean to text. define a feature? Um, it just means that you have to, on a sketch plane, you, you need to um, sort of like uh, make sure that like certain parts of it are uh, like, on, on a sketch plane, you have to define things relative to the origin or else like it, it's not gonna really sort of like function well when you um, when you actually print it so, or when you actually like uh, make something, you, you always have to define something relative to the origin um, or something like that. Let me see if for some reason this text box isn't very working very well. Okay, I think that's good. Okay, so yes, I can ex So what I'm gonna do right now is I'll just move this text, this box. Okay, I think I'll do it right there. Yep, I think that's good. And then I'll, I'll extrude this text. Line. So now you can have sort of like imprint of the text within this um, pyramid. Something is. There you go. Yep, so I just so I'm just re removing material from the pyramid and as you can see it's now imprinted within uh, this thing so if I were to like uh, make a no, if I were to make a section view you could see that it's now imprinted within this and there's the uh, other thing the other like whole present in the pyramid. And so another interesting thing and powerful uh, thing about CAD is you can do assemblies. And to do an assembly here, let me just quickly make another part that would be helpful for an assembly. Uh, wait, Georgie, what, what were the dimensions of this thing? Of like the, uh, cube? the cube of the, the hole? Oh, this, yeah. I don't know, it's, it was random, let me check. Uh, Here, I'll just show something. It's 1.291 by 0.145. Oh wait, okay, could you possibly make it, um, here, no, I'll just do it. Like a nicer number? Yeah, wait. I'll just make it two, one by zero point two five. Here, I'm just going to make another part that could possibly fit into that pyramid. making a rectangle right now. Now I'm going to uh, define it as 1.25. And the length, I'll just make it 10 inches. And then I will extrude this 
1.25 inches. No, 0 0.25 inches because that's the height of that thing, of the other one, of this one. Or you change the color of it, interesting. Yeah, so you can like, for like um, so some of the powerful uh, things about Onshape is that you can actually assign materials to it. So I can choose something like, um, I'll say iron, I guess. And it gives me all this types of something. Or if I want to do like PLA, I can search up PLA. And it gives me um, different, oh, give me ABS. That, that's like an, another type of um, 3D printing filament that I can possibly use. So I'll just use iron for this case. It doesn't really matter, cast iron. And if you do that, you can check here, you can check out some of the properties of um, of uh, this thing, such as its weight, surface area, mass, center of mass, moments of inertia and random stuff like that. And so another interesting thing about um, assemblies is you can actually um, sort of like add parts to it. Wait. So uh, let me think. I need to add something. To add a part. You insert the parts to Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot how to use Onshape. And so, for example, if I want to create a uh, slider mate, actually, no, let me just. I are made between that part, yes, and then I need to make a transition. What is the slider made? It essentially sort of like slides. Um, it just allows you to um, move the extruder some. I know, it, 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 no. but this may allow you to like move materials back and forth relative to each other. And what are you doing right now? What is the section view? Um, it just so it just allows you to like demonstrate the powerfulness of Onshape, because Onshape it, it doesn't just allow you to like create parts, but it also allows you to like show and like uh, demonstrate how they move relative to each other. If you wanted to animate this, or I can just show you. So it shows you how like, random parts can move. So you can see I kind of messed up the mate terribly. Oh wait, let me let me fix it. But it just shows you how you can certainly move random things, parts relative to each other. So firstly, I need to. Uh, there you go. That works. Okay, it's going the wrong direction. Just slide back and forth. Maybe you could do a simple fastened mate and then maybe show us some other on shape projects you've been working on. Sure. Um, well, fastened mate just simply attaches two things together. You just, um, here. Just simply attaches two things. So if I were to I were just to like uh, attach um, okay. so we'll just simply attach these two together. Like that, if I wanted to make, like there's also different types of mates. Do a rebel you mate too, so that'll just attach that, and I can do one right there. I do it, it can rotate relative to each other. So the, this just shows like some of like the more um, powerful aspects of it. And so some other projects that I've been working on, uh, let me, uh, I've been, I, I mean, normally I would be working on my projects for my 
robotics team, but we haven't been really doing stuff due to COVID-19. So I don't really know if I have anything else to share. Um, here, I'll just teach about drawings too. So drawings are like like another important uh, part of like manufacturing and like part creation, and so essentially a part a part studio is essentially where you make the part. An assembly is essentially where you define various relationships between parts and you kind of compare how they move relative to each other. So, for example, a real life example here. Let me quickly uh, pause my. Share. Can you guys still see the see the document? Yes. I'm just quickly finding another document. Uh, I will. Oh, so here's a real life example of um, of what I mean by like manufacturing and uh, part development. So this is what you call um, it's still loading, but this is essentially a brake pedal, and this is a part studio. Sorry, wait. So this just shows like a real life example of how you can um, use sort of CAD designs to like uh, create real things and like real ideas. So I can like um, show you an example of how this works. So this is a brake pedal box. And so I can take apart, for example, this part and I can move it back. I can like. See, I can move it back and forth and you can see on the bottom how it moves relative to each other. So this is like one more powerful features is that you can um, uh, sort of like um, demonstrate real life movements, uh, real life movements in a three, in a, a di digital perspective. And this sort of saves a lot of time and money in the sense because you can like assign various materials. You can like test real parts together such as this and you don't have to really create this in real life. And this one uh, tells you all the properties. So for example, my like um, robotics team, what they do is they actually CAD uh, their full robot before um, before they actually build it. And so that kind of saves a lot of like time and money in the sense that like you can check beforehand whether certain uh, parts are compatible and they're functional together. And that makes like um, designing aspects a lot easier. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I have. I can talk about drawings, but I'm not sure how important they are currently. So, you yeah, have any other go into points? drawings. Wait, sorry. You can go into drawings. Okay. Uh, let me quickly. Sorry. Okay, let me quickly. Here. So these are um, drawings, essentially. So if you if you make a part, for example, this is a random part that I think I made. And so it's just like, it's like a bolt thing you would connect. And if you want to actually manufacture it, since what is the material of this? No material, but imagine if this is made of like, um, you need to manufacture somewhere. What you do is you would have to make a drawing of it as shown here to like specify the to, to like specify to the manufacturer how you would want to um sort of create this uh this bolt or this material so for example this shows a uh, view from the top and it gives the various dimensions of the part as you can see uh, this part gives you a cross-sectional view and it kind of demonstrates how um various radii present in the uh park are there and also gives you it just essentially gives you the that gives you the dimensions 
And so if you want to like make a part and you've made it and you want to actually create it yourself, you would most likely not have the material to make it. So you'd have to, to, to send it to someone. And so this is how you do it. You would send this drawing with this material and they would make it for you and essentially like, um, and, and like send it back to you for like some amount of money. And so this is essentially what like drawings are. You just like uh, specify how you could make this object and the, and the dimensions required for it. Um, yeah, I think that's what drawings are. Talks about assemblies and part studios. I think, yeah, that's all. I mean, there are other types of stuff. There's like versioning and like other stuff. If you want, I can like talk about Kira too, if you want me to do that. Should I do, do we have enough time, Brian? Uh, yeah, you can talk about that for a bit. Okay, so if, if I want to um, 3D print this part, uh, it probably wouldn't be good because plastic is kind of weak in the sense you need to use like metal or something. But if you want to like 3D print it, you'd have to go to export. Uh, you would use STL. I would use, yes. Wait. I So you would export it as an STL file, options download. And then you would open, uh, here, sorry. Let me quickly. So then I would open Cura. is currently currently loading right now. So this is how Kira looks. Um, so, um, so you would take the actual 323 object, drag it into there, and it should come. Wait, let me try it again. Okay, so you take this object, you drag it. Oh, for some reason it's not working. Oh, there you go, now it's working. You normally should copy. Here, let me try something else. Not normally copying. Um, let me just try something else quickly. For some reason, it's not copying, so I'll just uh, put some other document into Cura. Okay, 
So I just put a headband into here because, because for some reason the other document wasn't loading onto Cure. And so this is essentially what Cure does. It's a splicer software. And you essentially define uh, three, and you, 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 you define where you want it to be on the bed. And so I could like rotate it or I can like um, rotate it personally, like stuff like that. And then so, yeah, and then so essentially if I wanted to uh, print it, there are all various printer settings. I'll go to basic to make it easier to understand. But essentially layer height, which is like how thick each layer that the, uh, that the printer prints, like how thick it should be. There's also wall thickness, wall count. It's essentially how many times does like the printer go like over it, over the thing. There's info density, which is like how much uh, percent if you've got materials that are like uh, have a lot of space inside of it, like if you if you printed that like a pyramid that like Georgie made, you have the option of like how much percent of the inside you want filled. So if you did 100%, the like inside of the entire pyramid would be completely filled, but that would be like a waste of plastic. There's no need for that much. Normally, 35 to 40% is normally good uh, for like semi strong prints. If you're looking for something more like strong, you might want to use like 80 or 90%. And you can also choose the infill pattern. Um, so this is like an example of a headband. This one's used, this is like, if you actually pr printed it out, it would look like this. And just, just an example. So infill density, this has an infill density of like 35%. And it has a pattern, a cubic on the inside of it. So printing temperatures, how long, Printing temperature is how uh, hot the extruder should be. I use 200 degrees Celsius. Uh, build plate temperature is essentially how hot the build plate should be. Uh, I use 60 degrees Celsius. I use print speed of 55 millimeters per second. I can go higher to like maybe 75 max, but I would, uh, I doubt that the quality would be very good. Enable retraction just means that uh, when you um, when the printer moves over from like different areas and it's not printing, it's going to pull the film into back. Uh, I obviously I uh, allow the printer to cool itself. Uh, there there's no need for supports. Supports are generally expected when you have to print something above the ground. So if you were like um, if you were like printing something like above it, you would have to generate supports because it can't just print it up randomly in the air. But since I'm printing directly on the ground, there's no need for me to generate supports. But if you were to print something upwards or some part unsupported, you would have to generate a support. And yeah, so this is essentially the, the main aspects of 3D printing. So some some challenges that I that I face a lot during the 3D printing is sort of like um maybe just like being efficient in the sense and like leveling, because I'm not very efficient and like a lot of plastic gets wasted for like random reasons and like another issue that I used that I used to have is like leveling leveling because as Georgie said I would say it's like I would say that it's like one of the most tedious um parts of printing because you have to make sure that the distance between the bed and the extruder is the is the exact um difference is like the exact amount because if the extruder is too far away from the bed then the uh print won't stick to the uh stick to the bed which happened to me countless number of times. And if the extruder is too close to the bed, then you'll have a very hard difficulty of pulling the print off of it, off the actual bed. And it like sometimes leaves like white like pieces of the actual bed on the back of itself where you pull it out. Um, so then you would, yes. Yeah, so, and then, so if you would, if you want to print this out, you would just click slice this and then it slices it. And then, this just estimates how long, so it says two hours and 15 minutes. It takes 21 grams of uh, filament and about 7.14 meters filament. So you would specify the printer, I mean, what type of material and your nozzle size essentially, and, and the type of printer you have. And then you would essentially just copy this file onto a, a, uh, onto a TF card or an SD card, or you would, um, or you just kind of connect your printer to the uh, connect your computer to the printer. I use the TF card, and so I just um, I don't have the TF card with me yet right now. It's actually in in the printer, but I would just take it, attach it to my computer, do an adapter, and then I would just 
uh, copy the file onto the TF part and then move the TF part into the printer. And then I'll just press print after making sure it was leveled. And yep, I think uh, that's all for 3D printing, I think. Cool. Um, thank you so much, Moda. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to share my screen again to show you. I think you can see my Chrome page. Is that correct with the slides? Um, and so um, just to sort of bring it back to the original focus of this workshop, which is um, our PPE initiative. I know that we had a little intro at the beginning about how we're able to sew these masks. Um, and then Moda demonstrated at the end uh, he showed that headband through Cura and also one of his own. Um, and I think what we really want you to take away from this workshop is that um, with all of this new innovation and all of these tech tools um, that we have available to us that are um, very inexpensive, um, we have the ability um, to um, promote civic engagement. We have the ability to create our own tools, regardless of if you went to other workshops where that's like you have the ability to create a website or an app that makes a difference in the world. You also have the ability to create masks that hundreds of people can wear or face shields that hundreds of people can also wear in order to keep people safe during COVID. And I think that's the real magic behind um, having all these tech tools around us. And that's a huge reason why Team TechSF is making sure that um, like everyone can have access to these tech tools and tech resources. Um, and uh, we really wanna get other people involved too, because um, the more the merrier, it starts with like a few people who are interested um, in sewing masks. We can give you the materials. You don't have to pay for um, fabric or uh, PLA plastic to make the face shields or plastic sheeting um, at all. Um, you just, uh, we deliver you the materials and you can create um, impact hundreds um, and soon thousands of lives um, just from your own home. Um, and so this is a tweet that we uh, put out um, a few weeks ago uh, for our first delivery of PPE to the Human Rights Commission. And we're looking to make another delivery of hundreds of face shields and masks um, in a week actually. So I believe Georgie sent a link in the chat if you would like to get involved in our PPE initiative. Uh, we are allowing people, um, teens who are outside of our organization to get involved. We would just need to like send you some details on what we'd expect you to do. Um, and then you can earn community service hours by doing that too. Um, and we've had a lot of people do that as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm hoping that maybe Georgie can um, uh, put in the chat where to put that contact information again. Oh, you already did. Okay, cool. Um, and so if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask uh, any Team Take Step leadership member here. Um, and also, uh, we're going to go ahead and close the workshops now that it's 1220 and we're going to go ahead and wrap up uh, very soon. Okay, we're just gonna wait like a minute or so um, as people make their way back. Is everyone back? 
Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we just want to say thank you for everyone that was able to make it today. Um, and thank you to, you know, like all our partners, including uh, Make School, you know, the mix at SFPL, um, Lensational, Feminist AI, Youth Funding Youth Ideas, Youth Empowerment Fund, um, Facebook, and Sharp. So we just want to say thank you for um, every panelist that was able to come out and um, just speak on behalf of what you guys do and also um, every person that was a part of the workshops. Um, a few announcements. If you are interested in um, joining the Teen Tech SF leadership, I can drop the link for you guys to fill out, um, which I will drop now. And then also we have an ongoing workshop series that we just started in March. So if you're interested in that, um, workshops are every Saturday from 2 to 3 p.m. And I will also drop the link to that. And yeah, to conclude this event, um, we want everyone to just type in the chat like one thing you've um, received from either like the workshops or the panelists or um, just something that you took away from this event. And yeah, we just want to say thank you again for everyone that was able to come out and um, participate. And we're very um, happy to be able to host this. And it was an honor to be able to host this. So yeah, thank you so much. If any of the other Teen Tech SF leaders want to add something, feel free to do so. Yeah, can we get like Shravya and Georgie to also speak a little bit? Because I know you guys are also like chairs, vice chairs also. You could talk about um, the process or like you know, yeah. anything you have to say to the participants. Yeah, sure. Not much, but um, thank you guys for coming. Um, we're happy to have like all the panelists and all of you guys to attend. And we hope you guys had a great time. Yeah. and. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and we're really glad that we had a wide um, variety of uh, panelists and um, from different sectors in the STEM field. And um, more about our upcoming workshops, we have workshops on web development, different app development, and um, CADing with Onshape. And maybe if you were in the PPE, if you attended the PPE workshop, Maybe you're a bit interested in um, attending those Onshape workshops to learn more about CADing and making 3D models. And um, if you want to sign up for our upcoming workshops, here is the link. And we hope to see you there. Thank you for coming to our STEM inclusivity forum. Yeah, so um, feel free to um, hop off or like you or stay on if you have any questions for uh, Teen Tech SF leadership. Um, we really encourage you all to sign up to join our leadership team if you're really in, if you're interested in supporting our mission. In um, you know if you went to the PPE workshops, if you're interested in sewing those masks and 3D printing masks for community members, uh, if you're interested in that, sign up to be part of our team. Or if you're interested in teaching your own workshops and you have you know, things that you want to contribute, also feel free to sign up. Or if you want to plan this event, maybe one day yourself, feel free to join our leadership team. And you just have to fill out that form. It's really um, very accessible and it's very, um, really welcoming community here. So we really um, encourage you all to sign up. And if not, to at least sign up as a participant for our uh, upcoming workshops. So thank you all so much for coming. Please stay behind with any questions and we'll also send out like an email probably with different resources and the contact information of our all our panelists and speakers. And uh, yeah, so have a great rest of your Saturday. Bye everyone.